Okay, thank you very much. I, unfortunately, some the usual technical difficulties, they say that in this last year, the most overused expression is, you are on mute. And sometimes I guess one of us isn't even on, on video. Well, listen, this is, a, this is a great panel and obviously a very important and timely subject. I think you already noted Bashir very accurately, and this is the task of BizTech, uh, which has been formed at a very opportune time in history, that we're really basically in a recovery mode, get back to a, a, to, to a new normal. And one doesn't expect that new normal uh, to be exactly like the old normal. We hope that while we solve some of the old problems, we will tackle some new ones and make a better world. And in the context of business, international commerce and transactions for Canadian companies and companies and individuals the world over, what is more important than governance and the rule of law? And I think the way that this panel would like to discuss that issue is really look at two things. The rule of law doesn't really mean anything unless the rights of individuals and institutions and corporations are appropriately um, honored and enforced. And, uh, and then of course, uh, the front end of that is that good governance and some of this we will discuss in the panel in the afternoon um, is there in, in a robust fashion. This is a wonderful panel and we are honored to have Lady Justice Joyce Alawich who is from uh, based in Nairobi right now. I think you have all seen her um, her biography in the materials. She has had a distinguished career as a jurist, first in the High Court of, um, of, in Kenya, then, uh, then in the Court of Appeals, which is the highest court, uh, or used to be the highest court at the time before the new constitution in Kenya. And then she went on for nine years to the International Criminal Court, uh, where she eventually joined the, uh, the presidency of that, uh, of that international organization. Uh, that court and um, she was reminding us yesterday that it was 12 years ago yesterday uh, that she actually was uh, elected or appointed to the court. Uh, Stuart Kerr is uh, based in the Washington area like myself. Uh, Stuart has had a distinguished career now uh, and uh, we have known each other for uh, going on 35 to 40 years. I haven't kept exactly counted, uh, but Stuart spent a lifetime in the international development arena, uh, focusing not least on um, uh, African countries and emerging democracies. And his work really has been to affect the rule of law around the world, in particular, strengthening those institutions that um, are relevant to robust, fair, balanced international transactions. So, um, you know, we could spend a lot of time on just people's biographies, but I think uh, we will just get started on the uh, substance of this. And, uh, um, uh, you know, it's an honor to be here uh, with this distinguished panel. I think, as I said a second ago, there can be no argument that good governance of government institutions, great ethics, and the implementation of the rule of law are essential to everything that makes for effective government, effective companies, institutions, and indeed our very way of life. Uh, without getting into politics, I guess one could say that uh, we have seen the failure of that, whether on this side of North America or on other sides, uh, the, the failure of that uh, has significant consequences. Um, so the object of this uh, exercise here today for our tribunal, our little over an hour, is that we need to figure out ways to implement the rule of law more efficiently. Right now, we feel that both in North America and in other parts of the world, the rule of law is under siege. I think at the macro level, one could argue that the very, um, the very fabric of democracy has been at risk. Um, and as we see elections in other countries and we don't need to name them, uh, the same has been uh, true. But I think we can be uh, somewhat uh, optimistic that everything isn't a negative. Uh, we, we have to figure out ways to improve things, but 
there is hope for optimism, uh, not least the events of yesterday with the, a new government in the US, which is very committed to the rule of law. Uh, by the way, I note that uh, Lady Justice made, made me promise that I'd wear a blue tie today, which I have honored that uh, commitment. I think that um, one of the things that is, as it were, the elephant in the room is the restrictions imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic on the rule of law and how it has arguably made the rights of people even uh, worse than they ordinarily would be um, uh, in, the, in the world at large. In terms of good governance and adherence to the rule of law, large companies from companies in North America to companies all the way across to, let's say, China, uh, have a mixed um, sort of, uh, you know, performance on issues and how they implement investment strategies, for example, in places around the world, uh, not least in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we hope, of course, that this will all change. And later in this uh, um, in this section of the uh, the day, we will talk about the uh, UN's United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and uh, various commitments on the um, uh, you know environmental sustainability and corporate metrics, the business roundtables statement of the purpose of a corporation and so on. But we'll come to that in a second. I think we will start first with the justice because as I said a min minute ago, unless we have um, good in in enforcement, excuse me, of the rights of people, uh, then all the happy talk about the rule of law doesn't mean very much. And so justice, let me start with you and start with that whole subject of the pandemic which has had an effect on people's daily lives and on the question of the enforcement of rights of both individuals and companies, not least in uh, your native East Africa, but all over the world. Um, here in North America, for example, a lot of the courts came to a virtual halt. Uh, things have picked up again, but as we all lawyers say, justice delayed is justice denied. And so it's fair to say that a lot of people have um, have had difficulty with uh, getting their rights heard in courts of law or other institutions and had therefore uh, the ability to have their rights vindicated. Uh, how, how have you seen this uh, justice in, um, in, in your part of the world? Uh, justice, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, excuse me. Thank you for inviting me to, uh, to this panel. I think I'll start uh, by saying that um, I personally think the rule of law, I mean, the, the COVID pandemic even infected the rule of law. I say that because um, when it first hit this side of the world, I don't know about uh, where you are, there was partial or total lockdown. The first uh, two months or so, few months, partial or total lockdown, there was mass fumigation of um, and disinfect disinfectation of streets and markets. There's of course the usual social distancing and wearing of masks, supporting the most vulnerable because there were uh, elderly people who are vulnerable. Restrictions on social and public gatherings, closure of offices and other facilities except for essential services like hostels. Uh, promotion of vigorous um, hand washing. And I personally think that's a good thing because um, maybe we had all forgotten our hygiene that we should be washing hands. And uh, declaration of a state of emergency and curfews and all these, um, all these things affected people's rights to, because the courts were closed. Uh, at the beginning, initially the courts were really closed. So people couldn't get access to justice. And yet um, the lockdown for some strange reason also resulted in a lot of domestic violence and economic crisis. And so, uh, you know, just nothing was moving for, for a while. There was no way in which people, you couldn't, victims could not go to courts to seek their rights. 
because at the beginning, at the initial stages, the courts were closed to so that um, there were protocols. Ministry of Health had protocols at, uh, and, and uh, those had to be observed. So that was the state of emergency that came with COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, just this, when, if you had, uh, as one often does, an emergency situation where you have to go in for a temporary restraining order, indeed, whether it's domestic violence or some big commercial issue, um, could you go somewhere to try to get emergency relief, whether uh, from a court or otherwise? Uh, yes, at a very limited level. I remember a time when um, I think it was the initial stages that courts were held, but either in an open space or in the verandas and ve very, very rarely inside the courtroom. So urgent measures, uh, those who required urgent um, orders would be able to be attended to. But the number of people was very, very limited as to how many people could be, whether it was in an open space, whether it was in a veranda, how many people could be there. It was, uh, it was really restricted. You, you hardly, like in criminal cases, I remember you'd, I would see um, a policeman, uh, the magistrate, uh, the, 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 the victim, the, acute, the victim and the, his, her or his lawyer, the accused, it, the number was limited to, uh, in order to protect uh, the spread of the virus. And I think, uh, Stuart, we would agree that our joint experience in other parts of the world, that, that's a very similar situation, isn't it? Um, Stuart is also on mute, but we will come back to you in a second, Stuart. I'm, I'm, off, I'm off, but uh, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, not, I'm not really a courtroom lawyer here in the U.S., but certainly from judges I know, there have been all sorts of workarounds they've tried. And of course, uh, you know, some of the criminal cases particularly have, have had to push forward and uh, courts have been open particularly for them. Um, I know, Justice, you mentioned to us the other day that you would you would see hearings, if not in veranda, sometimes even under a tree, which uh, which is an intriguing thought of, a, you know, a, a criminal matter being being handled <laughs> under a open, tree. Open space. Yes. If there was an um, open space under a tree, but the idea was to have it open, not in a closed courtroom like, like we, we know. Yeah. For initially, that, that it changed, but initially that, that's really something like that was happening initially. And I think this, uh, this takes us to the very logical point that um, uh, you know, we've all accepted that the enforcement of rights in the courts of the world, wherever they may be, are um, uh, take a long time. And I know that this has been part of your life's work is that you have spent a lot of time thinking about and implementing other forms of dispute resolution, whether it is in the business or commercial context, or it is in the areas of um, uh, employment, family, succession, or, or indeed other matters. And um, uh, so um, I think uh, we should take several minutes now to discuss alternate dispute resolution. And as we all know, there are many variations of it, uh, but not least arbitration and mediation. Uh, but let's start with mediation first. I know you have been extremely active in mediation for a long time. Uh, can you Tell us how mediation came to be established as a norm in Kenya. And as I understand it, it was really jump-started in a big way after the new constitution came out, uh, what, about 10 years ago now? Yes, the, the current constitution, I prefer to call it the current constitution. It was new, but now it is the current. Ah. That is the constitution 2010. At Article 159 2C, it makes provisions for alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, ADR. And uh, it mentions um, conciliation, negotiation. The negotiation is when people are still able to talk, mediation, arbitration, uh, ETC, and traditional methods of, of resolving disputes. This is encouraged in the current constitution. 
Now, the, 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 the Chief Justice that we had, uh, I wasn't here, I was still at The Hague, uh, Chief Justice uh, uh, Mutunga. Now he took, um, he took advantage of these constitutional provisions and then um, had um, amended the relevant laws, which I believe was the Civil Procedure Code and created um, a mediation accreditation committee. And that committee in uh, 2015 then drafted rules for mediation. And the following uh, year, then um, <clears throat> uh, a pilot project was launched in the judiciary, a quota next mediation pilot project. It ran for about a year. There were there, were, there was evidence of success. And the following year, it was made a permanent program uh, of the court. So today we have court and next mediation program at the Kenyan judiciary. Uh, what and, uh, percent, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna sorry, say what percentage of cases end up going to mediation? Um, it was, uh, I, I wouldn't quite say the percentage, the, 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 the system is that when cases are filed, then the judicial officers would make orders that I have scrutinized this file and is suitable for mediation. And when such an order is made, then the case would have to go for mediation. And um, I was very surprised that in Uganda, um, they also have got an next mediation, but then they have like judges, registrars, magistrates take part in mediation, which is not the case in Kenya. And uh, later on, uh, there, there was, there's been a few developments and one of them is that parties can decide, they can go to court and decide that we want to go for mediation. We filed a case here, it's taking too long, we want to go for mediation. So there are developments uh, ever so often. Well, and that's uh, good news. And I think to uh, remind our, uh, the people listening to this uh, session, that the whole object of this exercise here is how do we make our institutions um, around the world more efficient uh, for individuals and companies. And I think uh, just as you mentioned to Stuart and, and myself the other day that there, for example, there had in a, coast, a, a case you mediated, which had been in the courts for nine years. Um, first, first of all, I want to say that as far as I'm concerned, mediation really is just about the best for business transactions. Yeah. Because I don't think uh, people conducting business want to have their cases pending in court for long. Most cases that go for mediation, they take a just a matter of hours, three, four, five or so hours. And uh, parties, because the mediator assists the parties, um, it assists their discussion. And a neutral third party, a mediator is a neutral, but I always add a neutral trained third party who assists the, the disputing parties to talk. Uh, and if, I I might, if I might, I thought I could uh, add in the justice's knowledge is much deeper about Kenya than sort of like any of the rest of us is ever gonna be. But I have a few much more superficial observations about how several other African countries have managed this push towards uh, alternative dispute resolution, particularly in the civil side of the, of the yeah. courthouse. Uh, Ghana, an, an interesting approach that they have had, by the, you know, not dissimilar to Kenya. A couple times a year, um, the clerks in the court go through all the pending commercial cases and specifically ask the litigants if, if now, I mean, I'm, I'm not using the language of the law, but uh, have you suffered enough in the courts and perhaps you'd like to now reconsider the possibility of moving to either mediation or arbitration? And I think they've been in, in Ghana rather happy at the number of cases that shift. And it, it's, it's not just a benefit, of course, to, uh, to the litigants. It's a benefit to the court itself. It means that their docket is reduced. It means that other cases can move faster um, ergo, costs can be reduced and justice delivered faster. Um, as Javed was saying before, uh, justice mm -hmm. delayed is justice denied. And this is one of the great aspects 
of, of mediation adjacent to the courts. In the case of Lesotho, uh, where I worked extensively several years ago, um, this is specific to the commercial courts. And as the justice mentioned, uh, mediation has a particular aptitude as it fits in commercial uh, cases. <clears throat> in Lesotho, they decided uh, to make the mediation uh, mandatory, which of course doesn't mean that it must be resolved through mediation, merely that the, uh, that the two sides in the case must at least have an initial meeting with a mediator, which in the case of Lesotho is, is often the, the, one of the registrars of the court. But that's an also interesting approach. Uh, so there, there are lots of slightly differing approaches, but they're all basically trying to get cases out of the courts. And interesting, in the last uh, oh, five to eight years, even uh, the, the common law uh, jurisdictions in Africa were really first at this. But in the last five or so years, many of the civil code countries, I mean, I think in Benin, where I worked a lot, they've set up, again, uh, commercial court, they've set up a, a push to mediation. And frankly, they're very, they tend to be, this, this shows my common law prejudices, so I will apologize for that in advance. Uh, but the, the courts are very, much more traditional, I'd say, in many of the uh, Francophone countries. And as many of you probably know, um, in the Francophone countries in Africa, the, the high court does not, uh, is not able to set its own rules. The rules are set by the legislature. Um, so it, it, it requires changes of law at the highest level to do something like uh, approving mediation. Yeah, and I, I, would, um, I would note, of course, that, uh, you know, to, uh, to bring this discussion back to Canada uh, and to other uh, parts <clears throat> of the world, we have, you know, mediation protocols uh, in virtually every place. And as we will come to after we finish talking about mediation specifically, there are other forms of um, ADR uh, which are, you know, depending on the situation and the type of dispute, um, uh, you know, successful to a degree, but to come back to mediation specifically, so people understand justice, how this has worked. Uh, I know that you have been currently working as a mediator, uh, and they must be very lucky to get you when they do get you as a mediator. How does this all work? How does a mediation come to you? How are you able to manage a mediation uh, with, you know, obviously the, the health protocols and so forth? Maybe you can walk us through how that works. Yeah, before COVID-19 uh, pandemic struck the world, mediation here in Kenya and indeed in East Africa, and I believe in many countries, was face to face. I would sit in a boardroom and the parties would come with their lawyers. I would then have an open, uh, well, introductions, then um, um, open sessions, an open session, and then eventually it was necessary to go into private sessions. But all this, um, you know, all this face-to-face -face, uh, stopped and mediation like court litigation went virtual. Well, that's what we are um, uh, practicing now in Kenya, virtual mediation. Um, you, you know, you, what platform? I have always uh, mostly used um, Zoom because uh, in, in mediation, Zoom has breakout and you can to, to put people into parties into different rooms with their lawyers. As we, just as we used to do when it was face to face, we would have a, a room where I would put a party, you stay, you take some time with party A and the lawyer, you then get, get back to uh, party B uh, telling them, you know, this all confi mediation, by the way, is completely confidential. But now I find that uh, Zoom platform provides me breakout rooms and, 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 and that's what I use. But um, people do use different um, platforms. But my concern really at the moment is how many people have, stable, have the, this facility, have um, iPad, um, uh, uh, internet, smartphones, what percentage of people, not just in Kenya, I think uh, in many, many countries. And this might, um, this might hinder people from coming to uh, court or from coming to the, to, to the mediators because the mediator will say, 
sorry, we have to, this is virtual. Though today I had a fellow mediator who told me that the parties are just uh, plenty of defendant, lawyer, lawyer, and he said he was going to do it uh, face to face. I just told him, let me know how it goes because I'm still yeah. conducting my, my mediations virtually. And I think and a very important part of mediation that must always be emphasized and is, is in Kenya, is in Tan Tanzania, is this part, this region, and I believe in many other countries, there is usually no appeal in a mediated settlement agreement because this is a matter that the parties have discussed and the parties are in control of the decision to settle. The mediator remains in control of the mediation process. And this so, is why I think this is just the best for business transactions, mediation. So let's say you had two companies uh, in your example that reached a, a mediated settlement facilitated by you. Mm -hmm. uh, how would that then become an order of the court so that it was a non-appealable non judgment? Uh, if you have been accredited in this country, for example, as a court and ex-mediator, the minute uh, um, there's a settlement agreement arrived at, this settlement agreement will, can be taken to court to be made the final order of, 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 of that dispute. But um, despite that, there are many other, even private mediations that you hardly ever hear that they approached the court and they wanted an appeal because parties, um, disputing parties, they have taken so much time with the assistance of the mediator to go through the whole dispute, go through the facts, go through. The, and and when, once they've done that, a lot of people who are in business have managed to go back and resume their business relationships. Which is, of course, the best part of it. So um, let me ask you a question, and, and, and Stuart, you may have a view in other countries. Of what's the success rate of mediations uh, that you have done justice? Uh, you, you mean personally? Uh, or just from statistics you may have oh. from... Uh, from the statistics uh, today, I was talking to the registrar who is in charge of um, mediation registry and uh, she was telling me the success rate is uh, about uh, um, up, about 60 percent of the cases that go for mediation get resolved that's excellent yes. Which i'll add, add a couple other country examples <clears throat> in lesotho that i mentioned earlier the uh, court annex mediation to the commercial court this is a few years back, I'm not up to date on it, but after it was set up, they were, they were doing better than 50%, but not quite 60%. One of the best examples I know in Africa is in Senegal. Um, several years ago, um, with support from the French government, the uh, judicial system in Senegal set up five or six, what they call maisons de justice, justice houses, that were local mediation centers in neighborhoods. And they were to handle you know, uh, family disputes, uh, local land disputes, you know, in the town, and even very minor uh, criminal matters they were allowed to handle. And in these five, I can't remember if it was five or six of these maisons de justice, they were averaging around 90% resolution of cases. They were typically small matters, but uh, these, these, it was really much appreciated by the neighborhoods where they worked um, it's also, I mean, it, for, for a sort of higher rule of law aspect to mediation, one of the uh, great difficulties, particularly in urban areas of Africa, is that people have moved from their homes. There aren't traditional means to settle disputes. And uh, the possibility of going to court, if for no other reason, is prohibitively expensive. So that a dispute that you might have in the neighborhood really has very little possibility of fair resolution. But with neighborhood mediation centers, um, if you can hit 90% resolution, it means that for an ordinary person, the judicial system actually serves them. And I think that's really bringing rule of law to the people. And you think of the political element of this. If people, if people are feeling frustrated at their ability to seek justice for themselves, that's not going to endear the governments to them. But if they feel the governments are addressing their needs, 
however simple they may be, you're going to have a much happier populace. Yeah, I think um, okay. Justice uh, the. May I add something to that? Yes. Um, it would be a mistake uh, to think that mediation only started with the current constitution. There has been informal mediation going on in this country for many, many years. And it's in some parts of the country, it still goes on. Or um, not just Kenya, uh, several countries. I remember um, way back, I, I established the family division in the, in, in the High Court of Kenya. I think that would have been about 200, uh, would it have been two, many years back. And it's only later on when I learned about me, when, when, when I became a mediator, I looked back and I said, oh my God, what I used to do was actually mediation because I encouraged people, I encouraged parties and their lawyers to, to step out of the room and then I would give them some topics and I would tell them, can you discuss this as I get on with other cases? That was a form of mediation. It was informal, though I was uh, sitting as a judge. And um, th th this thought of, uh, it goes on at community level. A lot of mediation goes on at community level and they get, get matters get settled actually. No, that's, uh, that's exactly right. And I think if I were to bring it to a little bit, to, as it were, the other end, uh, you know, that's my experience as a transactional lawyer in North America. This, this is very much the case. Sometimes you can put labels on these things, but the point simply is finding more efficient ways for people to have their rights vindicated mm -hmm. and for a resolution of disputes. And, you know, I'm thinking, for example, uh, back to uh, many situations, including some involving major Canadian companies, where what happened was more or less just what you described, uh, Justice. We, um, you, you know, you would have a form of, hey, let's just take a break and try to solve this problem. And oftentimes it worked. Um, uh, and for example, I, uh, you know, I, uh, when you read the literature, for example, people put labels on it like mini trials or, you know, there are other variations in the theme. But for example, I have uh, seen situations, one actually involved a Canadian company that I, uh, for obvious confidentiality reasons, won't mention. But the way it worked was uh, the two companies, to use Stewart's expression, had suffered enough in long drawn out court proceedings. And so they took a break. They set up a full day event. And uh, each side, the, the two very senior officers of the two companies sat in a room and each side came in and made a presentation uh, of the case in a summary fashion, you know, not the thousands of pages that sometimes one sees in a litigation in, um, uh, in, in various uh, forums. And uh, after each side had made a presentation, however long it was, I think probably an hour and a half each, uh, the two CEOs kind of looked at each other and said, you know, um, I'm not sure I'm going to win, but I don't think you're, I'm not sure you're going to win. I, I wasn't in the room then, but basically they settled the matter based on those two presentations. So it was almost like a, two invested uh, parties listening to each side in a fairly concentrated fashion and saying, this is the best way to move forward here. And I think you're right. I think the, the various informal methods of resolution without having to go through the entire judicial process is a good development. And in this context, of course, you know, arbitration is the one that most of us talk about when we are thinking of uh, uh, alternate dispute resolution. And I guess um, uh, we can talk a lot about that in the various international institutions that exist for arbitration. Uh, but before we get there, uh, Justice, um, just to help the help our viewers understand the fundamental difference between mediation and arbitration. Yes, what I can say is the main difference is that in arbitration, the arbitrator makes the decision after listening to parties. Um, the, the plaintiff or the defendant plus their witnesses, then whether it's an, one arbitrator or th a, a tribunal of three arbitrators, they make the decision. This is in sharp contrast with mediation. In mediation, the mediator does not make a decision. 
The mediator explains the mediation process and assists the parties in their discussions, in their negotiations. But the final decision to that dispute lies with the parties. They have the, the authority to make a decision that they can live with, if I may use uh, those words. That the mediator does not make a decision for the parties. That is the main difference between arbitration and mediation. Right, and as, as we all know, um, and uh, I think most of our viewing audience will know, uh, arbitration is really a, a process uh, which by contract, or sometimes because of an underlying treaty, people have agreed that those certain disputes will be submitted to arbitration. And there are laws and treaties which, which then uh, create a framework around it. So you're exactly right when <clears throat> your disputes get handed over to a tribunal and that tribunal makes a decision, then the winning party can go and enforce that decision as a judgment of the court. And there are some limited exceptions to challenging that, uh, that decision, such as hypothetically, if the arbitrators decided on something that was not within the scope of their jurisdiction or because there's a suggestion of improper behavior or something or a conflict of interest or uh, a decision made uh, against public policy. Uh, for example, in the Middle East, you see situations where if an arbitrator presumes to award interest or enforce a contract, which is uh, contrary to existing law, that, that wouldn't be enforced. But by and large, normal commercial transactions, the world over can be enforced once they go through the arbitration process. I think the difficulty is, uh, as people have discovered, is when we first started talking about arbitration uh, uh, you know, many years ago, uh, it was seen as a much more efficient mechanism for solving disputes and vindicating rights. Um, uh, unfortunately, unlike your mediations, which you said you solve in four hours, which is remarkable, arbitrations can go on for years. So they're not perhaps in many cases much better than, um, than um, um, cool. you know, litigation. But uh, so Stuart, in your experience, people agree to arbitration because what's the one line answer to that? <laughs> because they hope to avoid going to court and they hope to maintain confidentiality of the issues at play. Yep. And of course, if you're in another country, there is a concern rightly or wrongly that you are not going to get uh, a fair shake because there's going to be sort of a home a home advantage. Uh, I would say, and I suspect our, uh, our listeners know this well, there are many international arbitration uh, institutions around the world and sets of rules, and they're, they're very good. They simplify procedures. They lay out how an arbitration should take place, and people have heard of the other ICC, not the Criminal Court, but the International Court of Arbitration in Paris or the American American Arbitration Association or the London Center or the Dubai Center or the Singapore Center. And we now have a number of uh, uh, arbitral centers, of course, in a number of uh, countries in Africa uh, with varying success, I would say, and uh, varying numbers of people who actually use them. What's your experience with that, Stuart? Well, <clears throat> there, I mean, it's highly mixed. Right now in Africa, there are over 70 uh, separate arbitral institutions. Some are multilateral, such as, uh, you know, the Ohada countries of West Africa have a common arbitration court. Although sadly, uh, they, they've recently redone their rules, which is a good thing, and they hope to get more cases. But typically, that arbitral body only has a case or two a year, which is unfortunate. Um, I think the most successful uh, on the African continent has been the Cairo Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration, um, a lot of small national arbitral bodies have been set up in the last 10 to 15 years. Although interestingly, many of them, while they had hoped to do more arbitrations, have gradually shifted much of their efforts to mediation. Um, and this is, this is mainly thinking just uh, disputes within a country or within a region, not say between uh, a, a large foreign corporation and a domestic institution. But I have to say, generally speaking, um, despite a great deal of effort by countries, by local chambers of commerce, uh, and by even local businesses, 
there has not been, generally speaking, a great uptake yet of arbitration on the local level uh, compared to, say, in the U.S., where the American Arbitration Association, I'm sure, uh, through various means, supervises thousands of arbitrations from tiny to very large in a given year. So, uh, um, Justice, please, let's go to come back to you. Sorry, I was just going to uh, uh, add something to what uh, Stuart has said. In Kenya, arbitration has been going on for a very long time for, under an act of parliament, uh, arbitration act, um, arbitration amendment act 1995 for a very long time. And uh, of course we have arbitration, uh, arbitral institutions. We have the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Kenya branch. I believe most countries have branches. The mother body is in, is in London. We also have new institutions like Nairobi Center for International Arbitration and so on and so forth. So in this country and uh, um, East Af within the East African region, I think arbitration has gone on for a very long time in this country particularly. Yeah. Well, that's that there's uh, been good news. some success in uh, Rwanda. They much newer than uh, the Nairobi Center. But I know they've pushed quite hard for arbitration as well and are seeing some success. Yes, I know about them. I was in Rwanda last year for a conference. Though I was, um, you know, these conferences that they are not just strictly arbitration, they are ADR. So the mediators can also attend and have a platform. Yeah. So I think whatever the, you know, relative limitations of arbitration too, um, it is still generally considered um, a more satisfactory form of dispute resolution uh, by you know, international companies or, or domestic companies, whether they be in Canada or someplace in Europe or in, you know, in Africa. And um, uh, you know, I think uh, notwithstanding my reference to the four year arbitration, and I've had some which have gone longer, um, the, um, it's still a lot better than the courts. And so Justice, before you went to the International uh, Criminal Court, uh, you obviously had so many years at the High Court in, in, in Kenya, and then of course later in the Court of Appeals. Uh, tell us about that. How, how was your experience in terms of uh, you know, efficiency, effectiveness, comp comparing it to your uh, current mediation role? Um. <clears throat> I was in the high court for a long time, really. And uh, what can I say about the, the Kenyan high courts? At the time, we were much fewer judges than there are today, and we worked hard. I believe that judges today are also working hard. But something, for example, like timelines for delivering judgments, we had 42 days within which to deliver judgments we tried to, uh, to meet that, but uh, the workload was a lot because every morning you had um, a course list. You'd start off with applications and then get on to hearings. But the, the good thing is that the previous day, you'd, the files would be brought to you by about 3, 3.30 p.m. So one had opportunity to read the files. I want to believe that... Um, uh, that, that arrangement is still going on because if you don't read the file, then um, you'd have, there would be too many adjournments. And that one thing I must say is that with a lot of respect to lawyers, I suppose even, even I'm also a lawyer, but there, there, there are too many applications for adjournment. There used to be even then. But today, I think they are even much more than, not just in Kenya, in, in, around our region. But I think the, what I want to say is that it is the judicial officer involved, whether judge or magistrate, that controls the court proceedings. If you start by granting adjournments, you really cannot blame the parties. But if the parties know that this, in this particular court, it is not easy to get adjournments, then the parties the lawyers will come to you prepared. And I think that's one of the things I did when I was in the high court. I made it very clear that I wasn't going to entertain flimsy reasons for adjournment. And what I used to do, which of course wasn't 
the, the, the lawyers uh, just used to wonder. I always encourage lawyers that you must bring your clients to the courtroom. So when a lawyer made an application for an adjournment, I would say just one minute, the parties, I would read their names and I would call out and I'd say, are, are you parties so and so, so are you in this courtroom? Then uh, more often than not, they would say yes. Then I would say, did you hear the application your lawyer is making? And half the time, some of the parties would say, the lawyer is in front there and I'm at the back. I didn't hear what he said. Then I would say, I'm repeating it to you. Your lawyer is making an application for adjournment. Are those your instructions? And of course the parties will say, no, we haven't discussed anything like that. Then I would tell the lawyer, sorry, this matter must go on. You haven't briefed your client. You didn't even tell your client you are going to apply for an adjournment. So judicial officers, judges, magistrates must be very firm on, on, on requests for adjournment. It must be absolutely necessary to adjourn a matter because that's a way of delaying matters in court, yes. I know that in some other countries in Africa where, they, where the, there haven't been strict judges such as you, um, in some chambers they have uh, in, put in place stricter rules to just to help the judges be more strict. I mean, the commercial, in many cases where commercial courts have been set up, the rules make it even harder uh, for continuances and for delays, just for that very reason. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's right. Again, uh, I remember being in, um, in a, it's sort of really a, a conference with a very distinguished uh, senior uh, judge here in the U.S. who who said, and in all his years, he had never had a lawyer come and ask him to accelerate things rather than you know, delay things. I thought that was a remarkable statement for this uh, fairly, you know, experienced and older gentleman. So, Justice, let's go on to, before we go to some governance issues. Um, it, it's not often that one has the privilege to uh, to talk to um, a long-standing member of the International Criminal Court, and I, I did a little research, and I uh, I noticed that uh, you were involved in that uh, famous and unfortunate case of the Gaza flotilla. Uh, but there are, of course, many other cases that uh, that uh, you were involved in over the nine years that you were at the International Criminal Court. I wonder if you would uh, wouldn't mind, uh, obviously, within rules of confidentiality, to talk about some of the interesting cases that you dealt with there. I dealt <clears throat> well. Once a judgment is delivered or a ruling. Or, but more so a judgment, once it's delivered, it's documented. So the confidentiality, I suppose, goes, isn't it? I, I dealt with um, one of the cases that I dealt with from beginning to end was uh, of the trial. That is, I was not, I did not deal with it at the pre-trial stage. Uh, John Pierre Bemba, um, who, was, uh, who was charged of war crimes and crimes against humanity, the trial went on for a long time. It was a long case. I think we had nearly eight, eight zero, 80 witnesses. And virtually all these witnesses were coming from um, Africa. And um, it went on for long. And unfortunately, by the time the trial started, the incident, it was like four years or so since the incidents that were that what that caused the accused person to be arrested had happened so we had the unfortunate um, it was very difficult because half the witnesses some of the witnesses would say this thing happened such a long time ago let me try to remember let me try to picture so i remember in my last three years in the court when i was a member of the presidency and i know that this is still going on we were trying, we were working very hard on ways of speeding up these trials, the trials at the International Criminal Court. And we we we, we came up with the ways in which the trials could be speeded up so that witnesses can give evidence within a reasonable time and not four, four or five years after the incident. So I also dealt with the, um, the case of Al Mahdi. He was charged of um, destroying some um, monuments in, um, 
in um, in Mali, oh. some yeah, some sentimental monuments. He eventually gave a plea. He pleaded guilty, and so on and so forth. The um, uh, was the makeup of the uh, the ICC. There were uh, judges from all over the world. Regions of the world, from mm -hmm. almost all the regions of the world. Yes, we only eight. The ICC has only eighteen judges, but during elections they try to get to to. To elect, uh, they try to give opportunities. Well, election is election like any other, but uh, they try as much as possible that judges are elected from different regions of the world. Yeah. How uh, how long is your uh, is a term? Is it nine years or is it less? One term of nine years. Okay, and then yeah. you can't repeat it, can you? No. That's why I said one term only. Okay. It's in the International Court of Justice that they can, they have, uh, I think they have, is it eight years or nine, but they can go for re-election, not at the International Criminal Court, no. Sure. So this has been uh, very uh, interesting because the, obviously the subject we were talking about here is if, uh, you know, uh, to kind of remind ourselves, if the rule of law means anything, it means effective enforcement of the rights of individuals, institutions, and companies. And I think we can, uh, this is a subject which could take a whole year to discuss, but um, you know, the fact is, as you've described, for example, with mediation, uh, whether it's in, um, in, in your case in East Africa or in, in my case in North America, uh, there's some positive developments. Uh, it's far from a perfect situation. Uh, the pandemic has created a lot of challenges in terms of efficient and effective, um, uh, you know, enforcement of those rights in terms of proceedings and so on. But but we're making progress. So let me take a few minutes to turn to the other side of this coin, which yeah. is something that yes. Sorry, yes. I beg your pardon. I think the most um, positive, the most recent and positive development in mediation was the coming into force of the Singapore Convention. Indeed. And that is very, very, it's, it's really good. It was, it's timely for business transactions because one of, the, um, one of the criticisms of mediation was that across country business transactions, how can you enforce a settlement agreement? But the answer has now come into the Singapore Convention those countries that have uh, ratified and uh, the Singapore Convention, they can have settlement agreements um, arrived at, uh, enforced across the board. And that's right. the most Just development. Yeah. In a sense, uh, in parallel to the New York Convention for Arbitration right. Awards, yes. uh, exactly. And I think it's, uh, that's, a, uh, that's indeed a topic on which one uh, should spend a lot of time focusing on because as as you know, business is rolled out in this new normal, uh, that will become an important convention. Uh, but let me, Stuart, uh, turn to you a little bit more and, and uh, discuss the following. Now, for the people who don't know you, Stuart, I think it's fair to say, and I'll include myself with this, you and I have spent uh, a long career in each case, um, which is why we both have white hair, I more than you, uh, on trying to do fair, balanced, business transactions across national boundaries the world over so that the, the results of those transactions are a fair sharing of the benefits and burdens, whether it's a mining project, and we have many a good Canadian mining company that does work in many parts of Africa and other parts of the world, or it's an infrastructure project, or it's a simple licensing arrangement, what have you. And... Um, you know, it's sort of interesting that uh, in recent years, there's been a lot more attention to, for example, uh, the rights of, or at least the obligations, if not the rights of stakeholders. Um, uh, you know, uh, some of the, our audience will have noticed the uh, business roundtable yeah. uh, um, statement, which has been, you know, signed on by a few hundred major companies in the world, at, at least in, in the U.S., uh, and what that statement says is that 
uh, unlike the old Milton Friedman-esque view that the only interest of a company is to maximize the profits of its shareholders, its owners, that in fact the obligation of a company is to all its stakeholders and that's customers, employees, communities, uh, suppliers, contractors, the environment. In other words, the ecosystem that makes those companies more successful. A separate discussion as to whether and to what extent uh, people have actually affected a real change. It's a relatively new statement. Uh, the same could be said, said for uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals. Each one of them is something that is you know, an absolutely wonderful statement. And if one goes and looks at the sustainability reports of major corporations, uh, certainly in the West, um, um, you see companies saying, we're going to focus on the following four SDG goals. So at least on paper, there's a lot of good stuff going on in terms of people making a commitment to that, which is our sort of Bible, fair, balanced transactions. What has been your experience, Stuart, with uh, <clears throat> how that you know, development has taken place, whether it's all positive, whether it's fast enough, and what are some of the current challenges to, uh, to, to you know, to further uh, achievement of those goals? Sure, so I'll just, stop uh, there and let you- Okay, just a few answer. comments and I, I, I won't say too much, but I think as <laughs> Javed intimated, there's, there's a clear trend in recent years uh, towards the broader involvement of stakeholders of all sorts and a, a movement away from that pure Friedman-esque, you know, the, uh, the purpose of a company is just to increase shareholder value. Um, and interestingly, even beyond the SGDs, there are other uh, aspects the UN is working on that I would not be surprised within the next five years if we see sort of uh, distinct evolutions in international law to make it uh, ever easier for local impacted communities to successfully sue foreign investors, domestic investors who have not, I mean, this has been, a, it's been a long road, but I think we're reaching a kind of a, a critical mass in the ability of negatively impacted sort of local, uh, local parties to create a ruckus and make companies realize that it's not just all about the, the short term profit I think in, in one way, you know, when Javed and I uh, first crossed paths, you know, in the early 80s, it was in the context of training on negotiating foreign investments. And to go way back to the 80s and even thinking before that in the 1970s, um, a lot of companies, international companies, particularly in the post-colonial uh, era, made deals with new countries that were, for the companies, short-term, very advantageous but were terrible for the host countries. Um, one of the things that various parties involved sort of academics and uh, internationalists realized, you know, these bad deals, you know, you company X may have thought when you signed this contract, great, I'm gonna make a lot of money. However, if the deal fails, if your country, company is nationalized or expropriated, you know, or just the country doesn't wanna deal with you, your benefits are not gonna go on forever. And that I think there came throughout the 70s and 80s a realization among the international business community that it was better to make a deal, that maybe in the first few years made less money, but went on longer and made it possible for the countries to get benefits, made it possible for the companies to have long-term benefits, long relationships, new deals. And I think we're in a way in another kind of pivotal era where country, countries and companies are realizing the balance is shifting between how, how deals are gonna be done. One of the things we're seeing right now in the last two years or three years, and I think we'll see more in the next couple of years, many countries are revisiting the kinds of international uh, trade agreements they've made, whether it's bilateral uh, investment treaties or FTAs, uh, because a number of these have not, turned out less advantageous for the countries than they had anticipated. Well, I think everyone agrees that the companies need and it's reasonable for them to expect certainty of law. Um, 
But I think a lot of, I mean, I know that South Africa is renegotiating deals, Indonesia is renegotiating deals, India is renegotiating deals. Um, so there's, there are questions about the nature of those. And to bring it to, right, to a US and Canada issue of the exact moment, one of the first acts that uh, President Biden did yesterday was, was stopping the uh, Keystone Pipeline, a, a very fraught issue for, oh, I don't know, the last seven or eight years, perhaps more. One thing that I think many people in the U.S. don't realize is that in all likelihood, the cancellation of that deal will wind up in, a, in arbitration, investor state arbitration, the Canadian company against the U.S. government, and it will probably mean that the U.S. government will pay tens, if not $100 million or more, to the Canadian company for the, for the cessation of that deal. And whether we can obviously argue the, the ethics of, is that an appropriate arrangement? I mean, was the Keystone Pipeline a good thing or a bad thing for the U.S., for indigenous communities that were impacted? A deal had been made fairly, and under the US, USMCA, US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, um, there's going to be arbitration almost certainly in that, and it's going to be very costly for the US. I mean, many parties in the US, among them, Chief Justice John Roberts, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate, and you know, the National Association of Attorneys General in the US have all come out quite strongly against this kind of uh, uh, arbitration. I, I, I'm somewhat ecumenical. I see that there are virtues in both sides, but I'm just sort of pointing up for your attention that there's going to be a lot of debate about these kinds of arbitrations and the agreements that undergird them. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there because it's sort of... Uh, well, let, me, let me ask a follow-up question of, of both you and the justice. Um, you know, uh, maybe this is the, the blinders of a person who has been sitting and mostly doing uh, work from the vantage point of, uh, of North America. Um, but I, I feel on, on balance, this is the glass is half full positivity yeah. that one should have, uh, that uh, the, the behavior of big companies uh, has improved along the lines you just mentioned, Stuart. And, you know, it is the recognition that long-term value is best created by in fact, looking after all your stakeholders. Uh, I'll park for a second, the whole issue of whether a uh, individual community will have the standing as a matter of law to bring an action, but you know, that's a whole more complicated jurisdictional issue, which perhaps the justice has a view on. But just in terms of the, what large institutions do in terms of their behavior as good corporate citizens, and we're going to talk more about that this afternoon. Um, uh, my, again, this is, I said, maybe a biased view, is that it's been an improving uh, performance by most major sort of S&P type 500 companies, uh, North American companies, European companies. Um, it's a little bit not the case, uh, for example, with uh, Chinese companies, uh, including in, in Africa. And let me start with you, Justice, whether you have any experience or perspectives on how Chinese state-owned enterprises and others uh, are operating in, um, in East Africa, not least in terms of their commitment to these larger values of uh, looking after their stakeholders. Now, when you say looking after their stakeholders, uh, what do you have in mind? Well, um, I, Stuart and I would both tell you, we often finish each other's sentences, uh, that uh, a big US company, uh, and I'm thinking of projects I've done in the Middle East and in the ASEAN region and uh, the Caribbean, there's a commitment to train local people to um, not just have people working at the low levels, but eventually bring them up in the management uh, scheme of things. Uh, to uh, uh, help develop community projects as part of their corporate social responsibility programs, that sort of thing. Uh, so there is a, there's a good focus on that. This is not just about us making a lot of money in a hurry, but, uh, but kind of the longer term commitment to the location of that transaction or that project. So I guess I haven't seen that with the Chinese companies in uh, Africa and based again on my limited knowledge of those transactions. I think you are right. I also, 
I don't know whether it's documented, but I don't see much of that. If anything, I see that uh, these big Chinese companies that come, uh, they come with, with most of their staff, if I may say that. So I don't know how much time or whether they have the interest to train the locals. I haven't done any, res any research on that, I'm not sure. No, I, I know one project uh, in a location uh, that would be familiar to all three of us where the Chinese company arrived with everything, including sacks of rice and workers, they put up a camp and the workers live in that camp, they eat in that camp. Uh, the only local employment was uh, a very few people, even at the very lowest sort of level of unskilled labor. And uh, the only thing they purchased locally was, you know, uh, gravel and sand and that sort of thing to, uh, for concrete, but everything else came from overseas. So yeah. that to me is kind of the opposite of the kind of project, uh, Stuart, that you and I have espoused our lifetimes. One of the things I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we could analogize the current situation of many of the Chinese companies working around Africa and elsewhere in the developing world to the sort of position that many uh, multinational companies uh, from Western countries were in, say in the 70s, when they hadn't really quite internalized that the value of long-term relations, long-term benefits. And uh, I, I think it's just, a, without appearing to sound condescending, I think there's, they're at an earlier stage of the learning curve of working mm -hmm. abroad and realizing that these long-term benefits, when all stakeholders uh, benefit, it will ultimately benefit the Chinese investor more. Uh, exactly, and I think that's really the, the lesson I think to take away is um, that good governance, uh, responsible governance of your relationships, your collaborations with other, uh, um, your, your counterparties, and the effective implementation of, um, of the rights of individuals and companies makes for uh, longer, greater relationships and enhanced value. So even if you are a narrow-minded, I want to make profits person, in fact, this kind of behavior leads to that result. I see we are coming up on uh, when we are supposed to um, hand off here. Uh, so let's just take a second to... Um, uh, to, so if you will, summarize some of the things that we have, uh, I hope, been, uh, been trying to convey. May I start with you, Justice? Um, maybe to conclude, I would like to say that, um, as I said earlier, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the rule of law was under threat in the sense that there were some leaders that were taking advantage of the situation and, um, and having a, a, a total grip on, on, on their citizens under the guise that uh, there was a COVID pandemic. And then of course, as I said, the court systems for a while were uh, not working. But what I'd like to say is that I recognize that in an emergency such as the one that we have had, and maybe we still have, there needs to be periodic checks and balances. If you say, if you're having, if you have curfews, if you have uh, whatever it is, it must not be indefinite. There ne it needs to be checked ever so often that uh, we, we pass some emergency measures. How, how, are, how are our people doing? Can we revise them? Can we go over them again? That I think, uh, needs to be, you know, that, that needs to be observed as much as possible so that the rule of law um, is not put to, you know, is, is not supposed to be put to trial, but in incidents like that can actually put the rule of law to trial. Because as I said earlier, COVID-19 pandemic infected everything, including the rule of law. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Stuart, as they say on the news broadcast, 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't know if you even have that. I think we're in a very interesting period of flux um, I th for both for rule of law and for transactions and for dispute settlement. I think the growing success of mediation around Africa um, is one of the best signs. And I think the fact that in, uh, a lot more money coming is coming into Africa while fraught with its own challenges, uh, 
will ultimately be a very positive thing. And I think particularly once the Chinese come more into a consensus approach of uh, how, how. And um, I, will, I will conclude here by just making this point that, you know, this is, uh, this is sort of one of those never ending journeys of trying to improve um, various institutions and all. And I think one thing that our very limited discussion points out is, um, you know, we need good leadership from the very highest institutions. Yeah. And I yeah. will delight exactly. to see the new president uh, and some of the actions he's already taken. Uh, but it also needs uh, inspired leadership from organizations such as, uh, as BizTech in terms of having sensible discussions about, you know, honestly, what is wrong and what can be fixed. And uh, this is not something we're gonna solve overnight. Uh, but I think as long as we have a positive attitude, we're willing to collaborate, understand we don't have all the answers, we can, we can make progress on this journey for the betterment of not just the individual institutions, perhaps where we work, but for the greater good of, uh, of all the peoples of the world. And with that, Bashir, we will close this uh, session. Very it's fascinating discussion. Uh, and thank you very much, Javed Stewart. Pleasure to, to meet you, e meet you, I guess is the whole term we use this day. And uh, Lady Justice, fabulous. Uh, I think there's a lot of the stuff there. And maybe we'll do some follow up session to talk about uh, other areas that you started and touched on. So, Stuart, I'm pretty sure um, we'll talk to you and mark your calendars down to all three of you on that. So, thank you very much. Folks, as we go to the coffee break, 1040, when we start again. So I want to thank at the bottom of my heart, uh, excellent uh, discussion. So uh, you're going to be obviously leading the uh, ethics and diversity uh, discussion later. So uh, we'll move on, folks, after the break, we'll move on with a fireside chat uh, between Bruce Croxon and Peter Schwartz of Cognitive. Um, and that's going to be very interesting because there's three sessions there. We start there, then Peter Schwartz, who is a passionate person about collaboration, has done it as a founder, will talk about collaboration, and then we go into the drive, uh, driving impact. That is a very interesting panel, too, with Peter Schwartz as the moderator, Bruce, Bruce Croxon, Ernest Lang of Promerita Group, Christine Stewart, who is the uh, representative from the World Economic Forum, Davos, and uh, you probably know her, she was foremost, former head at CBC. And we have Mark Kelly of Kelly Associates. So I think you've got some dynamite people also coming up. So hopefully, Joanne Stewart and, and Lady Justice uh, Aloach has set up the stage. So thanks once again. Enjoy your coffee. We'll see you all back in I'll, the session will be live. You don't have to log off if you don't want, uh, as I'll put the slide there for everybody. So take care and talk to you soon. Thank you. All the best. Enjoy. I know it's late, late at night for you. <laughs>